Hi, my name is Kirsten. I am one of the dietitians over at Temple. Um, I have been here for about seven and a half years. Um, I've been a dietitian not that much longer than that. So I've spent most of my dietitian career in uh, transplant, which has been very exciting. So we actually here at Temple do a lot of different organs, but um, I've been in with the lung transplant team um, from the beginning. So we also do kidney, heart, and liver. Um, so we see all of those patients. So my presentation is going to be mostly about um, food safety and guides to after transplant. I did get some of your questions ahead of time, so I wanted to um, address some of those. So we'll see some of those answers and kind of topic, topics at the end. But like Talia said, if you guys have any questions, just submit those through the question and answer and feel free to use the chat feature also. Okay. So the source of information for this, just so you guys know, is from the USDA and FDA booklet on food safety for transplant recipients. And it's also from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Care Manual, which has client education on handouts on food safety and organ transplant. So I took all those resources and made a, a handout for the patients I see here that they go home with. Um, and I, so I just pulled bits and pieces from that to kind of go over so you guys have the same information. Um, and you know, every program is a little bit different. So you obviously want to always get in touch with the your transplant physicians, nurse coordinators, dietitians there as well if there if you have specific questions um, or if you see anything's different in terms of the information. So what is the diet after transplant? So it's a special diet for those that receive the transplant organ. Um, and the purpose of it is to prevent those who've received a transplant from getting foodborne illness by restricting those high risk foods. Um, so just to kind of talk about it more. So when someone receives a transplant, they're properly a working, working immune system sees this new organ or organs as a foreign body, and it'll actually try and attack those new organ or organs. So in order to protect these new organs, the transplant recipient must take immunosuppressant drugs um, and that lowers their immune system on purpose. So the lower immune system allows the recipient um, to have those organs in their body without them being attacked, but it also puts them at higher risk for getting infections, diseases like the cold and the flu, unfortunately COVID, um, and also getting foodborne illnesses. So there's this whole group of diseases that are foodborne illnesses, meaning that we get them from food. Um, so sometimes you'll, especially in the news, hear about E. coli. Um, you'll hear about botulism sometimes, that's more rare. Um, but those are kind of some of the examples. So what we want people that have received organ transplants to do is avoid those foods that are at higher risk of causing foodborne illness to protect themselves and their new organs. So it's all about food safety. So part of that is cooking, part of that's produce handling, and part of it's temper temperature control, which we're gonna go through. So for cooking, one of the biggest things is washing your hands. And this isn't just cooking. This is anytime you're doing anything, touching your face, touching something outside. You always wanna wash your hands before you're then touching stuff and putting it in your mouth. Um, in terms of cooking specifically, so you want to wash your hands anytime after you touch raw meat. Um, a lot of this stuff you uh, hopefully will be common sense. That is my goal always, but some of it can be new based on what area people are from. Um, sometimes I've come across people that keep butter out on the counter and that is how they were raised and they never got sick from it. And so that's something they do, but really butter should be kept in the refrigerator. Um, another thing, so keep cold foods cold, hot foods hot. You want to put food away right after shopping and after meals. That doesn't mean you have to quick put the leftovers away before you even sit down to eat. Please sit down to eat. Um, but plastic, sometimes you'll hear about like kids in, in college that they leave the pizza out and they're eating it for breakfast the next day. Please don't do that. Um, do not thaw on the kitchen counter. So food should always be thawed in the refrigerator or the microwave. Um, if you are going to thaw it in the refrigerator, I know it doesn't thaw right away, um, but you do have a, a couple days to use it after that. If you are thawing in the microwave, you do want to cook it that day. Um, the other thing too is you actually can refreeze things that you thaw in the fridge. So say you take the chicken out today, 
you know tonight I am not gonna use that or you know tomorrow you're not gonna use that, you can actually put that chicken back into the freezer and refreeze it. Um, I was shocked when I found this out, but this is information from the FDA. I found this out about six to nine months ago. Um, so the other thing you wanna do with cooking is you wanna cook your meats and seafood until they're all the way done. And also you'll see below, you wanna make sure you cook your eggs all the way. So you want your yolks and whites to be firm and no runny eggs unless you're using pasteurized eggs. Um, sometimes I have had a couple of patients actually be able to find pasteurized eggs. I always encourage people, if you really like over easy eggs um, or poached eggs, to ask your supermarket if they would carry pasteurized eggs. Because sometimes they hear you say that and they think, oh, okay, well, that person's gonna keep coming here and they're gonna buy it so they're, we're gonna make money. Um, so it's always worth asking. Um, you also, in terms of cooking your meats and your seafood, you ideally want to use a meat thermometer, and there's lots of resources online about how to use them and um, what temperatures you want to get the meat to. For people using meat marinades, you want to discard that marinade or boil it for several minutes if you plan to use. You do not want to marinate chicken in some sort of marinade and cook the chicken and then put that sauce back on top of the chicken without boiling it for several minutes. Um, and lastly, this one can be the most different for people. You want to actually heat your cold cuts or your deli meats, um, hot dog sausages to steaming before eating. Um, the reason why, so there's a foodborne illness called listeria. And what listeria can cause is meningitis, um, which is not something you want to deal with. Um, you will have a harder time dealing with it than people that have not had a transplant. Um, and that can come from, like I said, the cold cuts, deli meats, hot dog sausages, and it's just the way it's processed. Um, so if you, for example, have leftover turkey for Thanksgiving, um, and that turkey was cooked correctly to start and cooled down in the fridge within two hours, which we'll talk about, then you can use that turkey sliced off the, off the breast, um, without having to reheat that. So that's different than deli meat because of how it's not processed, like you will find processed turkey meat. All right. So in terms of produce, so you one, you wanna rinse surface dirt off of all raw fruits and vegetables. Um, and you actually wanna wash or soak the fruits and vegetables, including those with skins or rinds that are gonna be removed. And that's really gonna be like your oranges, your melons, bananas, and how I kind of explain this to people is think about when you're peeling an orange or a clementine. You're using your hands for one. Um, so you're, you're getting your nails in there to open it up. So anything under your nails is going to get in there. Um, and then you're you, most of the time grabbing it with your fingers. So anything that was on the outside of that orange or clementine is now going to be in your mouth because you just touched the fruit and now it's in your mouth. Um, so a really great thing is just to wash it at the same time, wash your hands. Um, so then you're eliminating that. You don't have to wash the inside of the orange or the melon or the banana. It's just the outside where you're going to find that bacteria. You also have the option, this is not required, but um, to do a 50-50 mixture of water and white vinegar. Um, I more so like that for cleaning things like grapes, um, blueberries, things that are hard. You don't want to use it for raspberries. Um, and that it just kind of gets in the crevices, like grapes can be really difficult to clean. So it gets in the crevices that you can't normally get to um, just by rinsing it in the sink. Again, this is just an option. You don't have to do this. Um, for things like melons, um, especially like cantaloupe, you want to use a small vegetable brush to remove the remaining surface dirt or even the potatoes. Um, but you want to make sure you sanitize this brush between uses. So most of them, you can just pop it in the dishwasher and wash it when you're washing everything else. Um, if you're buying pre-cut fruit or vegetables, I know Giant around here has some great um, cut up watermelon, just takes the hassle out of it. You want to make sure that you refrigerate that stuff or surround it by ice. And even if you're also cutting those things up yourself and then um, you're making like a fruit salad yourself, you wanna make sure you refrigerate it. And all of that fresh produce should be refrigerated within two hours of peeling and cutting. Make sure with your cutting board, you wanna use uh, not the same board as cutting meat. Um, if it is cleaned, you can, but my scariest thing for me is when people go from cutting meat on a cutting board to like wiping it off or flipping it around and then cutting fruit or vegetables. 
um, you always, it's easier just to go and get a pack of four of those um, plastic ones and just have one that's for meat and one that's for fruit. Also with produce, you want to avoid raw sprouts. This is kind of a picture of them. Um, or you want to at least cook them before eating. So a lot of times you'll see these things at the delis. Um, just ask yours to be, be made without it. Even if you grow them at home, you want to stay away from it. The reason why they are actually one of the dirtiest things out there in terms of food and foodborne illness. They come right out of the dirt um, and they're very difficult to wash because they do usually fall apart if you wash them. There are some fruits you want to avoid with transplant because of the medication. So that's going to be grapefruit, pomegranate, and star fruit, which some of you may know, some of you may not. Next time you are at the grocery store, um, take a look around like the you, um, the tropical fruits, you'll see star fruit there, um, but don't eat it, obviously, if you've had a transplant. Um, it's not, you're not missing out, I promise. Uh, but these actually interfere with medication, the cyclosporin and Prograf. Um, you also want to avoid any unpasteurized juices and ciders. We'll talk about the unpasteurized in a little bit. And you want to avoid fruits and vegetables that are damaged or bruised. So temperature control is the next area. So you always want to use an ice pack or ice when you're transporting or storing perishable foods. Uh, remember, cold food should stay cold. You don't want to use or eat the ice that has been used to cool down foods or beverages. Um, what I mean by this, so I used to work at a concert venue across the um, river from here, and people, kids would always ask to eat the ice that we were cooling the drinks down in. There is so much stuff on the outside of those drink containers, so many hands. Um, so do you don't want to eat that? And you also don't want to put those ice cubes into your drink. So I really do find this a lot at parties. Um, you'll find people will use the same bag of ice for cooling things down and for actually putting in a cup to cool down a drink. Um, so just please feel free to ask for separate ice um, or just bring your own drinks if you're not sure what's going to happen there. Um, also check to make sure foods need to be refrigerated after opening. So some sodas, condiments, some all natural nut butters, you'll find this. I will never understand why it's written so small, but you'll see it here on the ketchup. Um, a lot of times I do have patients here that have like a soda that's open and it'll be on the ledge um, and it'll be there for a couple days. So it can be um, just not the safest thing. And then two hour rule is the rule of thumb for temperature control. So if you have something that's hot or cold, you take it out of the fridge or the oven, you have two hours. That is when it's, they call it the temperature danger zone is any temperature out of that hot or cold. And you only want the food to be in that temperature danger zone for two hours or you should not eat it. So if you, God forbid, take the chicken out, uh, which you shouldn't be thawing on the counter anyway, um, but if you take it out just to get that last bit of thaw, do not leave it out for more than two hours um, or you want to put it back in the fridge or back in the oven and cool it down or heat it back up. So that's always going to be your rule of thumb, especially for things like picnics, stuff like that. You want to either ask somebody to make a plate for you and keep it in the fridge um, or you want to make sure that you get there early so that the food is fresh. Uh, some other food safety and nutrition tips, don't buy dented cans, damaged food products, don't take any vitamins, minerals, or herbal supplements, including probiotics, unless you're given the okay by your transplant team. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, do not eat any food that's spoiled, moldy, or past its use by date. Cut back on salt, sodium. Um, so try using onion, onion powder, garlic, garlic powder, pepper, salt-free seasonings. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that too. Um, and do not use milk or cheese that is unpasteurized unless it's heated up or melty. Um, so unpasteurized means that food did not go through a process where it's flash heated and kills that bacteria. So the easiest way to remember this is pasteurized passes the test. Unpasteurized does not pass the test. So this is a, just a chart for you guys, how long things stay in the fridge and the freezer. Um, I believe that I did tell Talia that it's okay to send you guys this presentation. Um, and she did mention a couple different places it's going to be posted on so that you guys can look back at this more thoroughly. 
These are your high-risk foods to avoid. So this looks like a whole lot more than what I just said. Um, it's really not. It's really just that it's more detailed. You'll see like the unwashed raw fruits. Some of the things um, seem a little odd. So roasted nuts in the shell, you actually wanna make sure that you're having shelled nuts. Um, like you don't wanna have pistachios that, already, that are in the shell. You actually wanna have the ones that are already shelled. I know it's not as fun, um, but the reason behind that is a lot of times they're grown on the ground uh, or they come out of the ground and they, so they can be a source of bacteria. Um, but again, I'll let you guys kind of go through that too. And again, this is all from the FDA and USDA. These are your low risk foods. These are all the ones that are allowed. Um, and it's basically everything else. So these are just four basic steps to food safety. So we wanna clean, we wanna separate, we wanna cook and we wanna chill. So you wanna clean your hands, your surfaces, cutting boards, utensils, your fruits and vegetables and lids before opening cans. I know this is a very strange story, but my mom always instilled this in me that she, for some reason, would tell us when we were younger that you had to wash the top of the can because there were cats in the warehouse and the cats peed on the top of the cans. I don't know why it stuck with me. Um, I don't know where she came up with this, but now hopefully you guys will never forget this. <laughs> you also wanna separate, so you separate your raw meat, poultry, seafood, and eggs from your other foods. If you have meat in free, or, um, raw meat in your fridge, it should always go on the bottom shelf. Um, you wanna keep your fruits and vegetables at the top and your raw meat at the bottom in case it leaks. Um, and even if it leaks and you don't know, so it keeps that away from getting anything that you're gonna eat that's raw. And also consider separate cutting boards for raw foods. You wanna cook to your safe temperatures. Like I said, you can look that online. Um, and also chill. So you want to refrigerate your foods, like I said, within two hours, the sooner the better and never thaw on the counter. This is just other resources for you guys. So this is USDA. There's an Ask Karen um, website where you can actually ask this person questions that you have about food safety. There's a telephone hotline um, and some other food safety resources for you guys to keep. So this is the other nutrition areas I wanted to go over. So a lot of this was based on some of the questions you guys submitted ahead of time. Um, so someone asked about plant-based proteins versus animal proteins. So plant-based proteins can provide all of the amino acids of a animal proteins, but sometimes they have to be in certain combinations. So when a food or food combination provides all of the amino acids, they consider it a complete protein. And your body needs almost all of the amino acids um, some of them are a science lesson. Um, if you wanted to learn more about it online, you can look up complete proteins and understand that better. Uh, but some of the examples of these pairings, if you were gonna follow a plant-based protein diet, like a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet, so you wanna always pair legumes, which are like beans, lentils, peanuts, um, in combination with grains like wheat, rice, or corn. So think peanut butter sandwich, rice and beans together, hummus and pita together. Um, there's some other examples of, of plant-based proteins you don't have to combine, and those are going to be soy, quinoa, buckwheat, the Ezekiel bread, um, and there's a couple other that you can access on that website there. Um, salt and sodium, some people asked about, and I know I mentioned earlier too. So most sodium comes from salt, but sodium can come in other forms. Um, not all foods that contain a lot of salt taste salty, so many sweet items have a lot of sodium. Always read the label. This is how you're going to find out about that. Um, you can even do it for fun if you want to go pick some things out of your cabinet and look and see how much sodium is in things that don't taste salty. Um, but you always want to check the portion size and portions per container because we don't, most people don't eat a portion size when they're eating something, especially if it comes in a bag. Um, sometimes you'll see really weird number of portions per container, like one and a half. I don't know how people expect, are expected to split that up. but um, And in general, you want to aim for 1,500 milligrams to 2,300 milligrams per day of sodium. When you're looking at a specific food, you want to aim for 300 milligrams or less per serving. And then food from restaurants are almost always going to be higher in sodium. They add a lot of salt. If you watch any of those cooking shows, they're adding literally like a half a stick of butter and a handful of salt to every single thing they're putting in that pan. Um, and at home, you wanna avoid salting the water and adding salt at the table. 
Um, so my big rule of thumb is always taste your food first before you put salt on it. Do not assume it needs salt. The best thing about salt, about reducing your salt is your taste buds will adjust. I know it's not fun in the beginning, um, but if you look to the right, you can see there's different kinds of food items and it has suggestions for flavorings also, just so you can spice things up and make sure that it um, tastes good and not feel like you're missing out. So caffeine and soda, we had some questions about that. So caffeine is okay, but you don't wanna overdo it. If you're always tired, you wanna to talk to your transplant team and you also wanna make sure you have good sleeping habits. So a lot of people, especially with everything going on in the world, um, don't have great sleeping habits. You want to look those up online. You want to make sure you're setting your phone away. Don't have a TV in the room. Um, if you can find some other sort of white noise, if you are one that falls asleep with the TV, maybe it's just like a timer on your phone of like nature sounds or something like that. That can really help. Um, but try in those things first or while you're cutting down on your caffeine. Soda should be limited for the purpose of blood sugar control and weight control. So a lot of times soda can have a lot of calories. Um, I know diet soda, so I will not lie, I love Diet Coke. I have one probably twice a month now. Um, I did wean myself off of it. Um, it is like my little self-medication when I'm having a bad day, I'll still have a Diet Coke. But I make sure that when I'm having it, I also drink water in equal amounts. So I want you for every soda that you do have, I also want you to make sure that you have water as long as you're not on a fluid restriction. If you are in a fluid restriction, you should try and stay away from soda so that you're making sure you're getting enough water. Um, seltzer and flavored no calorie beverages are fine. Just check the sodium. Some of them can have a lot of sodium in them. Um, so you just wanna keep an eye on that. Lastly, weight control. I think I exercise is a big thing for me. Um, it keeps me sane. Um, it can boost your mood. It can also help you with your weight control, obviously. Um, and think about it as adding in, you wanna think about adding in the good thing. So I'm not one to say, I need you to go throw out all the bad, the quote unquote bad stuff in your house. Think about if you have the things that are good for you in front of you, you're more likely to reach for those things. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead one, everyone's a little bit different. So some people are okay to have absolutely no sweets in the house um, and they're fine. And other people ha can have the sweets in the house and they can still control themselves. One of the biggest things for me is when people say, oh, I have it for the, the grandkids. Why do the grandkids get to eat the candy? That's not something you need to keep in your house for the grandkids. I say that also knowing I go to my dad's house and I eat the junk in his, in his cabinets. Um, but it is, there's no reason that it means you can't have it with the kids. You can make that into a special occasion um, when things go back to normal, more normal, that you go out and you get a treat, which brings me back up to the one above that. I like to think of it as treat, treats, um, not cheating. I don't like the idea of calling it a cheat meal or a cheat day because treats imply that you don't have it all the time, one. So that's maybe once a month, that doesn't mean, okay, once a day, but maybe you need to wean yourself now back to once a day and then once a week and then twice a month and then once a month. And the other thing with treats is you better enjoy it. That's my rule. So if you're gonna have it, you better enjoy it because if you don't enjoy it and you feel bad about it, it's more likely that you're gonna eat those types of things. Um, and also watch your intake of liquid calories. So again, sodas, Juices, huge source of calories. Other nutrition areas, so this is just a brief thing. Um, herbs, you always wanna check with your pharmacist, your transplant team. Don't assume that they're selling at the store, it means it's safe. Um, and you always, always, always wanna tell your doctors what you're taking because it can interfere with medications. So there is a National Institute of Health website. It's a great resource. This is what I look up when people come in and they're taking things I'm not familiar with. Um, this is where I go. Um, also, their Mayo Clinic has information too. And if it says that there might be an interaction, assume that there is. Um, you don't want to take the chance. It's just not worth it. Um, when you, just some examples too. So when you're using these two things and there's more of them um, out there, you, this is as a dietary supplement. That's why I included this because it you're, I don't want you to get scared that you can't add garlic to food. 
So when it's used as a supplement, these can interfere with transplant medications. And again, these are just some examples. So garlic supplements can inter interfere with cyclosporin, Prograf, Celsept, Myfortic, um, and then milk thistle can interfere with serolimus. So just double check if you're taking anything, run it past somebody, please. So my main points, so I want you to always talk to your transplant team if you have questions. Um, the good thing about the food or drinks is if you're not sure about it, avoid it and follow up with your transplant team or dietitian and ask them. Um, if you have to follow a special diet for other conditions, which as we know, Lindsay's gonna talk about diabetes, you guys wanna do that along with following the recommendations for transplant. So lastly, food should be enjoyed, but it's important to take care of the gift you are given with transplant. So, and then this is just, this is me, since I didn't have video on this computer. Um, that's me and my two dogs. So I just wanted to say thank you and hopefully they make you smile. Thanks so much, Kirsten. It's Kelly again. So um, there's lots of questions for her. We are gonna hold them until the end again so that um, Lindsay can share her information about diabetes and transplant. Um, so Lindsay, do you wanna share your screen? And you might be muted. Um, Kirsten, you might have to stop sharing your screen. Do I? Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Let oh, it's okay. Me share. I'll share. Stop share. <laughs> um, okay, Lindsay, you can share yours now. Sorry for the transition. Lindsay, do you hear me? Yeah, I can. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to uh, pull this up here. So thanks everyone again for participating. So keep adding your questions to the Q&A at the bottom. Um, if we're not able to get to all of them, then we could still, um, we could try to send some of them to the speakers afterwards and maybe get some resources to share. Um, okay, thanks Lindsay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, like Taya said, my name is Lindsay. I'm a registered dietitian and diabetes educator that works for the Temple Diabetes Program. I also spend about a half a day per week um, working in the pulmonary clinic, helping to provide diabetes education for transplant patients, um, either before or after a lung transplant. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about what is diabetes, specifically the type of diabetes that develops following a transplant, um, how is it diagnosed and managed, what are the transplant specific risk factors, um, monitoring blood sugars and what should the targets be, and what different monitors are available. So I briefly just want to discuss the different types of diabetes. So type 1 diabetes is where the pancreas is not producing any insulin. Um, so this is an autoimmune disease. So typically from the time of diagnosis on, they are taking insulin the remainder of their life. Uh, type 2 diabetes is about 90 to 95 percent of the cases that we see. This is where the pancreas is not making enough insulin or your body cannot use it properly. So you're left with elevated blood sugars. Post-transplant diabetes is a type of diabetes that develops following a transplant in people that did not have any pre-existing diabetes. Unfortunately, this is a common complication after a transplant, and it's one that is pretty surprising. Um, I'm constantly hearing from our patient that, that this is the biggest surprise, um, learning that they have diabetes after a transplant. So there's no end date to when this can occur. So whether it's six months after your transplant or a year afterwards, um, diabetes can develop at any point. So there's a big variation um, in the reported incidence um, between the types of transplant. And some of the reasons for that is up until about 10 to 15 years ago, there was no standard definition or defining criteria for what is considered post-transplant diabetes. So we see about, um, Post-transplant diabetes develop in about 4 to 25% of our kidney transplants, 2.5 uh, to 25% of liver transplants, anywhere between 4 and 40% um, of heart transplants. Um, again, I work primarily with lung transplants where we consistently see about a third of those that go through a lung transplant do develop diabetes. 
So what are the risk factors? Um, we have our non-modifiable risk factors. So unfortunately, age. Um, as your age increases, so does the risk of developing diabetes. So older than 45 increases the risk. And then we see that risk go up by about 160% if you're above the age of 60. So unfortunately, the older you get, the greater the risk. It is more common in males. Um, if you're African American or Hispanic, you're at a greater risk. And if you have a family member um, with the history of diabetes, and that's again, type two diabetes. And then we have our modifiable risk factors. And these are pretty similar to what we see with risk factors for type two diabetes. Obesity, which is defined as a BMI above 30. So especially when you're carrying the weight around the abdominal area, you're at a greater risk. You're almost twice as likely to develop post-transplant diabetes if you are obese or overweight, you're at a much greater risk as well. If you've been identified as somebody who has prediabetes or if you have um, an elevated blood glucose uh, fasting levels or E1C, um, that does put you at a greater risk. If you have dyslipidemia or um, elevated blood pressure, um, those are all our modifiable risk factors. And then at the bottom here, you see we have our transplant specific risk factors. And the use of the immunosuppressive medications um, over time can increase the risk. The use of steroids um, over time can increase the risk of post-transplant diabetes. Um, having hepatitis C, low magnesium levels. And then there's also donor characteristics. So males, um, male donors and donors that had diabetes can also um, put you at a greater risk for developing post-transplant diabetes. So what are the causes of post-transplant diabetes? So earlier I discussed the different types of diabetes. Post-transplant diabetes share some similar characteristics to both type one and type two diabetes. So you can see here that steroids over time um, can cause insulin resistance. So basically it's just making your body resistant to the insulin that it is still making. Um, and it can affect other hormones that are used to control blood glucose levels. The use of steroids can also lead to beta cell dysfunction and um, the insulin in our body is produced in the beta cells. And then the use of the immunosuppressive medication. So tacrolimus can lead to um, beta cell dysfunction. So both the dose and the duration of the steroids um, can contribute to the risk of developing post-transplant diabetes. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this can occur at any time. So whether it's six months after the transplant or you know, if you've been on these medications for years, you're still at a risk of developing um, post-transplant diabetes. Um, so this slide discusses the diagnosis and the management of post-transplant diabetes. And this is put out by the International Consensus Guidelines specifically for post-transplant diabetes. Um, so within the first 45 days of a transplant, it is normal to see some um, hyperglycemia or high blood sugars. So individuals should not be diagnosed within that time frame, um, or they should wait till they're on a stable dose of immunosuppressive medications. After 45 days, um, they can be diagnosed with uh, post-transplant diabetes using any of the following. So either an oral glucose tolerance test, which is where um, you would take in 75 grams of a fast-acting glucose and then monitor blood sugar over time. A fasting blood glucose draw, so that would be a blood sugar of above 126 on more than one occasion. Um, a random blood sugar of above 200 with symptoms with an A1C. And what an A1C looks at is a three month average of your blood sugars. Um, however, this should not be used alone within the first year after a transplant um, since renal function, anemia, and immunosuppression, immunosuppression um, can alter this value. And then after a year, the A1C or the three month blood sugar average could be used. Um, or again, an oral glucose tolerance or fasting or random uh, blood glucose could also be used. Uh, and looking over here at the management, so on the right hand um, of the screen over here, um, again, it is normal to experience hyperglycemia following the transplant. And insulin is the most common choice 
Um, and that could be a long acting and a rapid acting insulin. Um, a lot of patients that do have pre-existing diabetes, even if they didn't require medications or taking oral medications prior to the transplant, may require um, insulin afterwards. Um, typically, once they're on a stable dose of uh, immunosuppressants, um, I know our doctor will, will shoot for once they're on less than um, seven and a half milligrams of prednisone or less than about 20 units of insulin, we try to transition them back to oral um, diabetes medications. And then just like with general type 2 diabetes, over time it could be managed with um, diet and lifestyle modifications, um, oral glycemic medications, injectable medications, or insulin. Um, I've seen about 15 or so, 15% uh, of the cases of diabetes can be resolved eventually. So we have a lot of people, even if they're coming out of the transplant, starting on insulin, eventually they may be able to come off of everything altogether and manage it through diet and lifestyle. So blood sugar monitoring is a really important piece of the management for anybody with diabetes, especially following a transplant. It really helps us understand um, if the medication regimen is working and how various factors such as, you know, what we eat, the amount we eat um, is affecting blood sugars. So there's no published guidelines on blood sugar targets specifically for patients with post-transplant diabetes. So in general, they follow this same targets as um, patients with type 2 diabetes and, and type 1. Um, so before a meal, that would be before any meal, before breakfast, before lunch, before dinner, we're shooting for blood sugars between 80 and 130. Um, and then if you were to check blood sugars after a meal, we would wait two hours after because again, it's pretty normal for blood sugars to spike up initially following the meal. Um, two hours after, we want that blood sugar to come back down and be below 180. So sometimes checking a post-meal blood sugar can be really informative to help us understand how the foods that we're eating, the portion sizes that we're eating, and if mealtime medications are working correctly to keep our blood sugars um, within that target range. And the target A1C that's been known to reduce the risk of diabetes-related complications should be less than 7%. Um, a lot of times with our transplant patients, they're checking anywhere from two to four times per day. It's normal for us to see that fasting blood sugar, usually at target, but because a lot of the, the uh, transplant medications and steroids are taken in the morning, it's normal to see a peak in blood sugars in that late afternoon period. Um, so if patients are only checking you know, once or twice a day, it's beneficial to alternate the time of day that you're checking. Um, so for example, if you checked you know, before breakfast and before dinner one day, check before lunch and um, you know, at bedtime the following day. And blood sugar control is obviously crucial. I mean, people with post-transplant diabetes um, are at the same risk of developing diabetes-related complications, um, which can cause vision problems, um, put you at risk for heart disease, circulation problems. It can affect all of your organs. Um, so it's really important that we keep that A1C down. So I've mentioned uh, hemoglobin A1C a couple times. So I think that this chart is pretty beneficial because an A1C is, is it listed as a percentage. So a lot of times our patients ask questions of, well, what does that look like if I'm checking my blood sugar? So when we talk about an A1C below 7%, we're looking at an average blood sugar of about 150 or below. So for example, if your blood sugar or if your A1C was 9%, you know, looking at this chart here, it would tell us that you're averaging a blood sugar of right around that 200 range. So anybody who's on insulin, um, if you're leaving the hospital, um, it's important that you understand what to do if blood sugars do go low. So low blood sugars or hypoglycemia is considered a blood sugar below 70. Um, so in order to treat it, the first thing you want to do, check your sugar, confirm that it's truly below 70. You don't ever want to just go off of how you're feeling. And then you want to follow the rule of 15 and 15. So what that would be is consume 15 grams of a fast acting carbohydrate. Um, so that this could be glucose tablets, which are little like sugary wafers you could get, um, four ounces of juice, not the biggest glass in your house or bottle, again, four ounces or half a cup of juice. Uh, regular soda, 
not diet because there's no um, carbs in that, and then um, a tablespoon of sugar or honey. You want to wait about 15 minutes and then recheck it just to confirm that that blood sugar does come back up. Um, a lot of times our patients are trying to treat a low blood sugar with a candy bar or a piece of pizza. Um, and keep in mind, things that have a higher fat content take way too long to bring up that sugar. So it's pretty important that you're consuming something that the body is going to break down very, very quickly and bring that sugar back up to that normal range. And then again, please make sure to recheck within the next 15 minutes to confirm that that blood sugar did go up. Um, so what could cause this, especially following a transplant? I mean, sometimes the steroid doses are adjusted um, and especially if they're decreased, sometimes the amount of insulin that you're on is, is just too much for you. Um, so if you're not eating enough carbohydrates at meals or you're taking your medication um, such as insulin without food, it can lead to a low. If you're much more physically active than normal um, or if you're insulin stuck. So what that means is if you're taking your rapid acting insulin too close together um, within like a window of two hours, it can cause a low. So what are some of the symptoms? Most people will feel shaky, sweaty, anxious, dizzy, um, Vision changes might happen. Um, family members might say that they're noticing they're a little bit more irritable or changes in personality. So again, it's something that we wanna make sure that we're addressing um, pretty quickly. And then hyperglycemia is a high blood sugar. Um, and people often will feel um, increased thirst, increased urination, they might feel more hungry. Um, headaches, blurred vision can occur. So anytime you're sick, if it's the flu, if it's a cold, any kind of infection, that's naturally going to run up blood sugars. Stress, um, whether physical or mental, um, of course, what we eat and the amount. Um, steroid use and then transplant medications can also lead to that. Um, or if you're just consistently running high, you just might not be on the right dose of insulin or uh, diabetes medication. And then I know Kirsten kind of touched a little bit on sleeping earlier, but not sleeping enough. Uh, so sleeping less than six to seven hours a night can actually negatively impact your blood sugars. So continuous glucose monitors have become a little bit more popular in recent years. So this is a little bit different than the typical blood glucose monitor that you're pricking your finger with. So all of these work to continuously monitor your sugar. So they're all set up where a little sensor would sit under your skin um, anywhere from seven to 14 days, depending on the device that you wore. Um, and it can reduce finger sticks. So the Dexcom G6 and the Freestyle Libra do not require any finger sticks. Um, the Guardian, I believe you still have to check your blood sugar twice per day to keep the, um, to calibrate the machine. Um, so what this does is it's picking up what's called your interstitial fluid. So it mimics what's happening with your blood sugar. So there, those two numbers are always going to be pretty comparable. So every couple minutes, you can look at your reader. So that could be phone-based, it could be on an Apple Watch, um, or it could be the handheld receiver that comes with the sensor and see what's happening with your blood sugar. So not only are you seeing you know, what the blood sugar is, but you're seeing an arrow, which indicates which direction your blood sugar is going. And you'll see a trend graph, which tells us what's been happening to your sugar you know, the eight to 12 hours prior, um, which can be really helpful, especially you know, in the mornings when you're waking up and you wanna go back and kind of look at um, what happened to your blood sugars the night before. So we are getting hundreds of blood sugars um, from these devices daily. So how is a continuous glucose monitor different? Um, as you can see on this slide, the little red dots are the finger sticks. So, you know, even if you're checking four times a day, that's great, but we really don't know what's happening between those finger sticks. So because a continuous glucose monitor is consistently monitoring that sugar, 
we're able to pick up both highs and lows. Some of these devices are also set up with alarms that they can automatically alert you if you're approaching a low or a high range. Um, this has really kind of been a game changer, I think, with a lot of our patients because we're picking up on timeframes where they're tending to run higher that they might not have been able to catch with finger sticks. And that way we can really try to alter the diet or incorporate lifestyle changes during those timeframes rather than having to always go up on the medication. So this picture here just kind of shows you what we can actually pull off these glucose monitors. This is an example of a two week average and it's showing you, you know, pretty much hour by hour what's happening to the sugars. And this is a great example of a, a typical blood sugar trend that you might see in a transplant patient. Like I had mentioned the fasting blood sugars a lot of times are really good but those medications are causing the blood sugars to, to peak in that late afternoon period. Um, so again, if you, unless you're checking your blood sugars during that time frame, that's something that you might not even be aware that you're running higher during that time. Especially during um, COVID, you know, we've been managing a lot of our patients remotely, and this has really been very helpful because you can also sync it up with your uh, healthcare provider, provider's portal so we can be monitoring these sugars remotely. So normally if I give this talk, it's over a time frame of one to two hours. So kind of a lot of information was, was condensed into a 20 minute span here, but a couple of the key takeaways that I think are really important to understand. Um, diabetes is a common complication following a transplant and there's no end date to when this can develop. So the majority of the cases might be diagnosed within that first year, but we're still seeing patients years after a transplant um, that can still develop diabetes. So some of the risk factors are transplant specific. Um, again, the use of steroids and transplant medications can increase blood sugars over time. Um, how diabetes is managed following a transplant can change. So even for those with pre-existing diabetes that you know, might have been able to be managed with one pill, you know, their level of blood sugar control can change following the transplant. Um, they may have to start insulin you know, temporarily or even long-term. Um, and, you know, work on improving the modifiable risk factors. So again, there is some research that shows that lifestyle interventions, weight loss, um, can reduce the risk of post-transplant diabetes. So, you know, even after the transplant, it's really important to follow healthy eating habits, um, you know, maintain a good weight to reduce that risk. <clears throat> 